All right. This is the American Yop, Chapter 9, Democracy in America. So this chapter focuses primarily on the presidency of Andrew Jackson, who is the seventh president of the U.S. And the introduction begins with a story about Andrew Jackson that helps kind of contribute to the symbol and the myth that Jackson became in uh, American society. And that is with the uh, kind of visual of Andrew Jackson killing another man. in a duel. And if you're unfamiliar, a duel, it's kind of like a medieval practice that, you know, by the time it was a medieval practice of a way of settling disputes. So for example, if someone had insulted your honor or tarnished your family name, um, it was expected that you defend your honor and defend your name. And so this was a, a medieval practice that had originated in Europe. It had kind of stuck with um, you know, European society through the ages and had made its way across the Atlantic into, uh, into the United States. And so um, by this time, dueling essentially meant just standing, I don't know, 10 feet apart and taking turns shooting each other um, until, you know, either the, the you know, one person was, was dead or could no longer duel anymore. And so the chapter opens up in the introduction by giving you this portrayal of Andrew Jackson as shooting and killing another man in, in a duel. Um, Jackson survived. He did really do that. But this was the type of, um, you know, kind of the types of stories and behaviors that sort of led to really what Jackson represented um, at the time and, and later on. And that is, you know, Jackson came to represent the quote unquote common man. You know, at a time period where politics was dominated by elites, dominated by merchants, you know, Jackson was representative of kind of the, uh, you know, the underdog, the little guy, and that's what he came to, to represent. And the fact that he had, you know, engaged in something like, you know, killing someone in a duel, again, also made him a lot different than a lot of his other uh, kind of political uh, contemporaries. So this connection between democracy and Andrew Jackson is very strong. In fact, some history textbooks will go so far as to even call, you know, a chapter like this Jacksonian democracy, right? Democracy being kind of political power uh, to the people as opposed to elites. So one thing that we ought to remember is that by the time that the United States had ratified its constitution, um, it was unique in that the United States was really the first country to be founded upon enlightened principles, not necessarily the first democracy. You can go back to like ancient Athens and point out democracy there, but democracy was somewhat new. It was a radical idea. And there's a tendency to associate Americanism with democracy. But the reality is, is that after the American Revolution, there was actually a kind of warning about democracy or a cutting back on democracy in the most Clear example of this is the U.S. Constitution. Now, yes, at the time, the U.S. Constitution was one of the, if not the most, democratic document in the world. But by today's standards, and even by the standards of those who created the Constitution, what they were trying to do was to make a less, uh, less democratic government. So we'll say about the Constitution and democracy that the purpose, and this is true, the purpose of the U.S. Constitution was to make a less democratic government for the sake of efficiency. And a lot of founders viewed that as a trade-off, right? You can either have more democracy and less efficiency or less democracy and more efficiency. And 
The reality is, is that many of the founders and the leaders of the nation said at the U.S. Constitution and even afterwards that we need less democracy to get a more efficient government. I mean, you can kind of run the experiment in your head um, when it comes to something like decision making. So when a decision needs to be made, is it easier to do that with more voices or less voices? Well, obviously, it's easier to make decisions when there's less people that have input. The risk that you run is that if it becomes too efficient, then it becomes not democratic. It's not democratic enough, right? And and oftentimes this is sort of illustrated between this um, sort of uh, anarchy tyranny trade-off. And when creating a government, you want to create a government that is democratic, but you don't want it so democratic that it's just chaos. At the same time, you want an efficient government. You want a government that works. You want a government that does stuff. Um, but you don't want it so strong and so restrictive that it becomes tyrannical. At the time, the country was moving more towards this direction. Jackson's going to try and bring it back this way. I mean, that's kind of what Jackson's presidency ends up, uh, ends up representing. So there was a strong kind of yearning for democracy amongst the American uh, uh, population. Now, Jackson's presidency is, uh, is significant. And in fact, when we think about the presidency of Andrew Jackson, one thing that it effectively does is that it helps to kind of cover up or mask what will end up being the more serious divide in American society. And essentially, we can think about American uh, society divided uh, uh, sort of in, in, in several ways. Um, the division that Andrew Jackson represents is the division between the common versus the elite classes, right? And that's kind of what this chapter is primarily focused on. Um, there is a, a lesser degree of separation between the federal government versus the state governments. But the most significant division, which again, doesn't really get a lot of attention quite yet, but certainly will in the future, is the division between the free states versus the slave states, right? Is the free slave divide. And in the meantime, Jackson's presidency kind of brings all the attention here, but this division is lurking underneath the surface. And the perfect example of how this division is lurking underneath the surface is via the Missouri crisis. The Missouri crisis is an early crisis between the free states and the slave states. It happens about 40 years before the American Civil War, though, but it kind of gives us an insight into the types of issues that would eventually lead to the Civil War. So the Missouri crisis involved, you guessed it, the state of Missouri. Missouri was ready to become a state. I right? had enough population to be a state. And that's typically how statehood uh, went, right? Once a territory had enough people, they can apply to become a state. When you became a state, then you get to send two members to the Senate, members to the House of Representatives. You get to vote in presidential elections, right? So statehood brings a lot of uh, a lot of benefits. Now, at the same time, something that would greatly complicate the issue over Missouri was that at the time, Missouri was also home to 10,000 enslaved individuals. That 10,000 enslaved people have been brought to Missouri um, clearing land, cotton plantations, other economic ventures uh, um, by the time that Missouri was ready for statehood. So when Missouri was going to enter the Union, the question was, would Missouri be a free state or would Missouri be a slave state, right? That is kind of the question that hangs in the balance. And this was coming at a very crucial time in American politics because the number of free states and slave states were equal. Okay, the number... of free and slave states were equal. So what that meant was that if Missouri were to become a free state, that meant that all of the free states would have kind of like the tiebreaker vote when it came to the Congress. If Missouri were to become a slave state, that meant that the slave states would have like the tiebreaker vote when it came to Missouri. And in fact, at the time, most people who were concerned about the statehood of Missouri in the United States Congress 
were less concerned actually about the issue of slavery itself and more concerned about the political power. Right? What were what was the implications of having two free senators as opposed to two slave senators? And so northern states wanted the free state of Missouri, southern states wanted the slave state of Missouri, and this was primarily over the issue of political power, right? Not quite yet over the issue of slavery. Now, there's a very kind of important political trend that will continue to shift or change over time that sort of adds a little bit more to this debate over political power. We might say shifting political power. Now, the US Constitution does provide for a democratic Congress. That is, the more people that you have, the more votes that you get in the Congress. Well, the North, because of immigration, is growing in power, right? So as each new immigrant arrives on the shores of the North, the North gets more votes in the U.S. Congress. Immigrants aren't moving to the slave states. They're moving to the, uh, sorry, yeah, they're not moving to the slave states. They're moving to the free states. For the South, recall that the South has the three-fifths three-fifths compromise. So initially, because the southern states could count their enslaved population and then send more uh, representatives to Congress, it was always the case ever since the very beginning that the South had more political power than the North. But now because of immigration, you might say South three-fifths compromise, it is uh, maybe shrinking. in political power, All right? So as time goes on, there's a tendency for political power to go from the South to the North. The South once had most of the power federally because they could count their enslaved population, but now the North is growing each and every year as more and more immigrants arrive. So this is kind of putting more pressure, we might say, on this kind of question about who is gonna control the federal government. Will it be the free states or will it be the slave states? Well. So Northerners and Southerners in Congress argued about this, right? That is, hold down a little bit more, shrinking in political power. Uh, Northerners and Southerners argued in Congress about this. And so there was one proposal that came from, uh, uh, I believe is a, a senator, Senator Talmadge, and that is the Talmadge Amendment. Because one of the big problems for Northerners is this point right here. Like if you want a free state of Missouri, what are you gonna do with these 10,000 people? Talmadge made a proposal. He called for gradual emancipation in Missouri. That essentially Missouri would start as a slave state, but because of gradual emancipation, it would eventually become a free state. And this was seen as a compromise because the idea was that well, at the beginning, it would be a slave state that those slave holders there, the enslavers there would be, they wouldn't have to worry about their property being taken away, but gradually over time, we'll transform it into a free state. The Talmadge Amendment was rejected. Southerners were not willing to accept a gradual emancipation. Southerners wanted a slave state. Northerners wanted a free state. And it seemed as if the country was sort of at a, at a deadlock, right, at a deadlock. Um, so what eventually came was the Missouri Compromise. This was a compromise made by Henry Clay. Henry Clay is someone who we want to remember as the quote-unquote great compromiser, especially in... In this period, um, he seems to kind of get not just Northerners and Southerners, but mostly Northerners and Southerners to, to sort of get on the same page. So what did the Missouri Compromise uh, do? So in the question over Missouri, Missouri would become a slave state. So Southerners got what they wanted. Slavery would continue to exist in Missouri. What about Northerners, though? Well, Northerners got the creation 
of a new state. And that was Maine. Now, why was the creation of a new state, Maine, important? As a free state, that's what Maine was. Maine balanced the political power. So the fact that this compromise involves a free state of Maine, we could tell that Northerners were primarily concerned about the political balance and a lot less concerned about the issue of slavery itself per se. So the idea was that Missouri would be a, sla a slave state. They send two senators. Maine is also a free state. They send two senators. And those two senators kind of vote each other out, right? That there's no kind of shift in balance of power in the United States Congress. Now, knowing that um, this was an issue that is going to happen again in the future, they also agreed in the Missouri Compromise with a compromise line. And again, this is happening around the year 1820. So this is 40 years before the Civil War, but we're already getting a sneak peek into the types of issues that will put the, the, the country really on the trajectory towards, towards conflict. And the compromise line banned slavery in north of Missouri's southern border. So the idea was that, yes, Missouri was ready for statehood today, but tomorrow it's going to be Kansas, and tomorrow it's going to be Iowa, and the next day it's going to be Arkansas. So instead of having to argue about this every single time a new state was to be added, they just drew a line in the sand. It was on Missouri's southern border, so everything below Missouri essentially would be open to slavery. Everything above uh, Missouri, slavery would be banned. And that was that, right? Those are the three conditions of the Missouri Compromise, Missouri Slave State, Maine a Free State, and a Compromise Line. Now, at the time, like I mentioned uh, earlier, we can very clearly see this divide between the Free States and the Slave States. And standing where we are in, you know, uh, sort of current time period, having known the Civil War happened, uh, of course, we can look back before the Civil War and kind of see very clear examples of this. But for the time being, uh, again, J Jackson's presidency kind of serves like a band-aid over the free and slave state divide. This commoner uh, slash elite divide kind of gets a center stage, at least in this chapter. But there were some who either intentionally or not understood the kind of demons that were looking, uh, lurking behind the Missouri Compromise. And one of them was Thomas Jefferson, who said some rather um, interesting uh, things about the, uh, about the Compromise. Jefferson said on the Compromise at this time in 1820, Jefferson is well retired from politics. He is towards the end of his life. I think he dies six years after this. Uh, and this is what he said about the Missouri Compromise. He said, quote, this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once to be the death knell of the Union. Section four, the rise of Andrew Jackson. So the textbook goes into a, a brief kind of biography about Andrew Jackson and how he came to the, uh, to the presidency. He has uh, an interesting background, uh, including joining the American Revolution. at 13 years old. And after joining the militia as a 13 year old, he was actually captured by a British soldier during the war. And it said that when Jackson refused to sign the British officer's shoes, right, shine my shoes, Jackson said no, and the British soldier or officer cut Jackson in the face. And so he has a, you know, kind of a, a very kind of patriotic origin story, uh, joining the militia and fighting the British at, at just 13 years old. But um, afterwards, Jackson became much more involved in a variety of pursuits in the state of Tennessee. So he's most probably known for being in Tennessee, although I think technically he actually wasn't born there. Um, 
off topic, but I think uh, I was watching an episode of Jeopardy recently, and one of the questions was like, you know, Jackson, where was Andrew Jackson born or something along those lines? And obviously I said, duh, Tennessee. And I was surprised when it was wrong. So I think uh, technically Jackson wasn't born in Tennessee, although he is uh, kind of the most, uh, that's sort of the home state that he gets mostly uh, associated with. If, if he wasn't born there, he spent most of his life there afterwards. Um, in Tennessee, Jackson did a whole variety of various things. He was a lawyer. He was a slave owner or enslaver. He eventually made himself, uh, you know, some money. Uh, he was involved in local politics, going to the House of Representatives and the Senate. But probably more than anything else, what Jackson was known most for during his day job was his experience in the war. Uh, Old Hickory was the nickname. for Jackson in the military. And Jackson was a military general, and he was, he became the most famous, we'll say, uh, Jackson became the most famous general. Uh, in the War of 1812, which the United States fought the British at the Battle of New Orleans. So in addition to being, you know, a lawyer, a politician, a slaveholder, by far most people understood Andrew Jackson being a general. And the Battle of New Orleans was a battle that made Andrew Jackson a household name, even though that war, the War of 1812, really didn't have any kind of significant consequences in terms of like territorial acquisitions or, or anything like that. What the war did do was it provided a new generation of leadership for Americans. And Jackson was one of those figures that a lot of Americans knew that name because of how well he performed against the British armies. Now, in addition to military campaigns against the British, Jackson was also somewhat of a, I don't know, loose cannon, I would say. Uh, he sent American forces into Spanish Florida several times um, without kind of official approval. Some of those campaigns resulted in the adams onus Treaty, which, you know, is just uh, kind of a good thing to know. It's mentioned here in this chapter, so we'll go ahead and define this. The Anna, uh, adams onus Treaty uh, gave the U.S. Florida from Spain. So, you know, ever since the Spanish had arrived way back in the 1500s, the Spanish had always controlled Florida, during the colonial period, there was competition between like the English colonies and Spanish Florida. Um, this chapter sort of sets it up that because of Jackson's military incursions into Florida, the inability of Spain to defend Florida from Andrew Jackson, that eventually the Spanish just agreed to give it to the United States. And, you know, we could think of this treaty as just maybe also being kind of one other example of territorial acquisition that the United States is involved in. But um, Florida now belongs in the United States. Now, all of this background and biography uh, of Andrew Jackson ultimately culminates in the election of 1824, which is a presidential election, and this is a four-way race. And because of Jackson's kind of war hero status, he is a potential candidate for president of the United States. But he's not like his contemporaries, right? He's, he's unlike other politicians. Um, he's somewhat like, interestingly enough, George Washington. And that's really the only kind of contemporary that you can make jumping from a military career into politics. Someone who was not formally educated, Washington wasn't, Jackson wasn't, uh, kind of entering into the political thing. But, you know, everybody else, your Thomas Jefferson's, your Jane Madison's, you know, you know, they're all kind of, you know, educated, elite kind of bookworm types. And that's not what, what Jackson was, right? He was cut from sort of a different cloth. Now, in the election of 1824, there is no kind of strong candidate. And in this four-way race, we have kind of different candidates representing different sections of the country. Um, we have 
Henry Clay, who in many ways represents the West. You know, the West is kind of a, a new area. We have John Quincy Adams, who represents the North. And then we have Andrew Jackson. And he represents, in some ways, the South. There's a fourth candidate, but we don't really need to know him here. Um, and so when uh, all the votes are tallied, there's no clear winner, meaning that nobody has a majority of, not a majority, what's the, the plurality, that's the proper term. Nobody has a plurality of the vote, but amongst all the votes that are cast, Andrew Jackson has the most popular votes. That means that he has the most people um, voting for him, and he also has the most electoral Right, but plurality means that you have more than 50%. Right, Jackson did not have 50% of the popular vote, he did not have 50% of the electoral vote because with four people running, that meant that all the other votes were kind of split up evenly. Right, but of the evenly spread out votes, Jackson did have the most. Now, the thing was, even though Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams represented different parts of the country, what they did represent though that. You know, these guys were the traditional elite politicians, right? They were the well-educated, the well-informed. They'd been involved in politics. Andrew Jackson, I mean, you know, to say that Andrew Jackson represented the common man might have been putting it nicely. According to people like Clay and Adams and all the other politicians of the day, Andrew Jackson was a savage barbarian that murders people. And so the last thing that Clay and Adams want is a Jackson presidency. So they actually make an agreement with each other. And this agreement becomes known as the corrupt bargain. And this is an agreement that Clay will give Adams his uh, votes. Because what happens when there's essentially no plurality, it's the House of Representatives that gets to choose for the next president. And so in the House of Representatives, there were people that supported Adams, people that supported Clay, people that supported uh, uh, Jackson. Uh, Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams, they said this agreement, look, Henry Clay will give Adams his votes in exchange. Clay will be appointed to Adams' cabinet. I'll give you my votes. You'll be the next president, but you know, find a nice, comfortable job for me in the uh, in cabinet. And the corrupt bargain was made. And the sixth president of the United States is John Quincy Adams. Same president. Now, Jackson supporters cried foul, right? We have to remember that a lot of the people who are voting for Andrew Jackson they were already kind of suspicious of elite corruption to begin with. And the fact that Jackson got the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, yet somehow John Quincy Adams, the son of a former president, John Adams, can't really get any more elite than that. Um, the fact that they managed to kind of cheat Jackson out of the presidency, it only confirmed kind of their suspicions. And so in the four years that John Quincy Adams was president, Jackson supporters were very very vigilant and rabid about organizing. And the election of 1828 would be a rematch, right? And this is where, you know, Jackson supporters said, look, you cheated us out of our previous presidency. We're not going to let that happen again. And so in the rematch in the election of 1828, um, the election got ugly. Uh, like we mentioned before, Adams was slandered. as, you know, elite, corrupt, you know, kind of tied to, uh, you know, tied to like, you know, uh, European nobility and stuff. Jackson was, you know, a barbarian, a murderer, right? We can't have Jackson. He's, he's, you know, everything wrong with American society. 
Um, one of the individuals that got caught up in the crossfire of this very intense um, political campaign was Jackson's wife, Rachel Jackson. The wife of Jackson. And what had happened was that Rachel had been previously married before she married Andrew Jackson. And there were questions about whether or not she properly filed for divorce. And so what she was accused of was having been married to two men at the same time, which was a big, uh, was a big no-no. We might just say wife of Jackson was heavily slandered, right? And you can think of all the, uh, all the kind of inappropriate names uh, that might have been hurled at her for having been married to two men at the same uh, same time. Um, the story goes that Rachel Jackson was in a store and she picked up a newspaper or magazine. That newspaper or magazine was covering the campaign and she read a very nasty story about herself, right? You know, essentially they had said something very nasty about her and she became so shocked that she died on the spot. Now, whether she actually died from reading a nasty headline or whether it was probably more likely some sort of medical condition. She did die during the campaign. And Jackson blamed his political opponents for his wife's death. You know, they had gone after her and she passed away. And so Jackson is going to have this very much kind of no forgiveness, um, you know, attitude. As a result of the election of 1818, uh, 1828, Jackson had won. And this was the makings and the hallmark of a presidency who finally represented the interests of the quote unquote common man, or maybe more specifically, as your textbook puts it, the ordinary white American. Moving on to section five, the nullification crisis. So during Jackson's presidency, there are pretty much three kind of major things that Jackson is kind of at the center of. Um, the nullification crisis is one of them, and we'll talk about it here in this section. A second one is the bank war, and that gets covered in, uh, in this chapter as well. And the last thing that Jackson is most closely associated with is the policy of Indian removal. Now, unfortunately, Indian removal is not covered in this chapter, so it's going to be covered at a, um, at a future chapter. But typically, um, you know, Jackson does end up playing kind of an instrumental role in the shift in Native American policy towards, uh, towards removal. Nullification, bank war, Indian removal, probably the three things that are most closely associated with Jackson's presidency. So Let's get on to the nullification crisis. So the nullification crisis is a crisis over tariffs. In fact, in an earlier chapter, we covered nullification. Uh, remember that nullification is the idea that states have the power to nullify, and nullify is like cancel, right? Cancel. Well, maybe cancel is not the right word, because they're not getting rid of the law, they're just choosing not to follow. Uh, federal laws. So this idea isn't new. Um, you know, it's typically accredited to being proposed by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison during the Alien and Sedition Act. So the idea that state governments have the power to just not follow certain federal laws, it's, it's been out there before. But during the uh, time of Jackson's presidency is when it really starts to heat up. Here, instead of laws regarding free speech, which is kind of what the Alien and Sedition Act kind of came down to, here it's about tariffs and or taxes. Uh, a tariff is a tax on imports. And what tariffs are designed to do, they're designed to protect U.S. businesses, right? So you can raise money by, by issuing tariffs, no doubt about it. And 
especially in the early days of the United States government, uh, tariffs did provide some revenue. But mostly what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect U.S. businesses. So we have a kind of a little bit of an example here to show how, uh, how tariffs work. So consider that we have two industrial nations. We have the United States on one side and Great Britain on the other. And both of them have the capacity to manufacture. But in the United States, let's keep in mind that manufacturing capabilities was were pretty much relegated to the North, right? So the North has the ability to manufacture. So too does Great Britain. Let's say that because the United States is lagging behind Great Britain a little bit in terms of um, manufacturing production, the United States can produce manufacturing at about $2. Uh, an item, whatever item it, it is, right? It could be steel or iron or uh, whatever, right? Great Britain, because they've been manufacturing longer, they have somewhat of a competitive advantage. They can produce it for about $1 a unit. Now, the question is, well, which one is or are people going to buy from? And the answer is, well, at the cheaper price, most people are going to buy from the British. The American business is going to go bankrupt because of that reason. Okay, so what do Americans do to save American manufacturing? Well, the answer is add a tariff, add a tariff. Let's say if the tariff is $2, that means that if you're in the South and you're trying to purchase something that was made in the factory, now when the English try to bring their goods to you across the Atlantic Ocean because of the tariff, you are now looking at a price of $3 a unit as opposed to $2 a unit, which is what the Americans provide. In this situation with the tariff, the South is paying $3. It's buying, sorry, with the tariff, the South is paying $2, it's buying American. If you get rid of the tariff, that allows the English to sell their products for $1. That means that the South is now buying the cheaper version. So. What is this illustration trying to do? Well, it's trying to show you the effect of tariffs on the different section of the country. And that is to say, in the North, the North welcomed tariffs because it saved, or at the very least, protected manufacturing. The South, well, that's not how you say South, the South aided tariffs because they would be forced to buy expensive domestic. So all the tariff does for the South is that it forces them, whereas before the tariff, they can choose the cheap English version. After the tariff, when you add an additional tax, now they're forced to buy the inferior American version. It doesn't give them any benefit. So that's why the Tariff of 1828 in the South, it was called the Tariff of Abominations, Southern name for the tariff. So in short, the South doesn't want to pay for this, right? They don't want to pay for this. So resistance to the tariff laws is spearheaded by John C. Calhoun. He is from the state of South Carolina. And John C. Calhoun is one of those kind of very important politicians in this uh, era before the Civil War. Uh, probably him and Henry Clay are, are two of the most important ones. Uh, Calhoun had actually been the former VP to Jackson. Talk about their falling out uh, that they have, at least, well, maybe I'm getting a, a little bit ahead of myself. At the time being, he is the vice president to, uh, to Andrew Jackson. But he is one of the major supporters of nullification, right? We already said that nullification is the idea that uh, a state can bypass um, uh, federal laws. So what Calhoun proposes is that Calhoun uh, 
is proposing South Carolina not follow the tariff and continue to import cheap foreign goods. Cheap foreign goods. You know, it's one of those things where you might say, is the tariff good for the American economy? Well, that might be true. But is the tariff good for the American economy everywhere equally? And that's not true. It was better for the North because they had the factories, right? They want to see their businesses protected. But for the South, they don't have any factories. They're just being forced to, to pay more money. So John C. Calhoun says, look, I don't think in South Carolina, I don't think that we're going to pay this tariff anymore. And in fact, this creates a divide, not just between the North and the South, but a divide within Jackson's cabinet more specifically. Um, there's this uh, kind of showdown between the president and the vice president on this matter. What does Andrew Jackson think about nullification? Well, Jackson doesn't like it. He says, quote, our federal union, it must be preserved, President Jackson. Calhoun's response, the vice president at the time, the union, next to our liberty, more dear, most dear, excuse me. Uh, and that kind of brings up a kind of good notion of what it means to have like these competing views of Americanness, right? What does it mean to be American? What is doing your patriotic duty? Well, the union refers to the country, right? You know, the United States, what could be more patriotic than supporting your country? Well, according to Calhoun, liberty. And when you think about notions of liberty, is there any notion of liberty that is more appropriate than like protesting taxes? I mean, that's kind of what the nation was found on. So both sides believe that they're in the right here, right? Neither side thinks that they're wrong. This split with Jackson and Calhoun forces Calhoun to resign the vice president. Andrew Jackson brings in Martin Van Buren. We'll say brought in to replace Calhoun as VP. So Jackson and Calhoun have a falling out. Calhoun goes back to South Carolina and pretty much becomes the face and, and leader of resisting this terror. In 1832, South Carolina does the unthinkable, and that is they actually pass an ordinance to nullify the terror. All right, South Carolina. I mean, before this, they had been kind of chatting about it and talking about, about it but uh, actually hadn't done it yet. The South Carolina legislature passed this in 1832, and that is South Carolina officially nullified tariff. Um, there were even threats about secession taking place at the time. Secession is for uh, a state to break away from the Union. We'll just say that South Carolina threatened to leave if they had to pay a tariff. And we'll just say to follow tariff. Okay, so things are getting pretty tense, right? Andrew Jackson takes the position that, no, look, you're going to follow it. South Carolina is saying, nope, not going to follow the tariff. And if you try to make us do it, we're actually going to leave the country. So there's, again, not so much the idea of a civil war happening, but you certainly get a sense that, you know, we're seeing some cracks in the system. In fact, if you were to go and look back at American history before the civil war, and say to yourself, okay, was there at any point before the Civil War where the United States almost got to that point where it got pretty close? Well, this nullification crisis would likely be it. I mean, that's about as close as you got to a Civil War before the actual Civil War took place in 1861. Now, the response from Andrew Jackson and the response from Congress was rather, um, rather upfront. And that was the passage of the Force Bill. 
And the force bill authorized Andrew Jackson, president, again, former general, the guy who killed someone in a duel, authorized Andrew Jackson to use the military to force the tariff on South Carolina. on SC for sure. So there's certainly a sense that uh you know tensions are uh tensions are are rising. Now, civil war did not break out. Andrew Jackson did not need to use the military. And certain politicians came to save the day. Uh let's see if you can guess it which politician was the one who came to the rescue. If your answer is Henry Clay, you are correct. Henry Clay is the great compromiser. Henry Clay made a compromise tariff. And that was a tariff that would gradually go away. So the tariff or the tax would be in place initially, but it would gradually, uh, gradually go away. Uh, that, we'll say, ended the crisis. So things had gotten pretty tense up until that point. And of course, the nullification crisis does kind of foreshadow uh, a lot of what is to co uh, come, especially when it comes to uh, things like uh, like secession. Um, what is the importance of this, right? What is the significance of this? Well, one is that South Carolina backed down. And federal authority, that is the United States government, prevailed, right? The United States government maintained its control over the states. When a state got rebellious, South Carolina was essentially put in its uh, place. Second was that, well, this is kind of one of the earlier examples when secession is talked about uh, maybe in a more uh, open and serious way. Um, obviously, secession becomes very important later on. And the third thing was that one thing that we can kind of tie this to is that when the United States government you know, sort of reined in its federal authority here. Um, this made a lot of the slaveholding political elite a little bit uneasy. We might just say that uh, the slave, or we'll use the term in the text, the enslaver political elite, say, became more fearful about the future of slavery. Section six, the Eaton Affair and the Politics of Sexuality. So this section covers kind of a lesser known incident that happened during Andrew Jackson's presidency that involved most of his cabinet members, that is kind of the inner circle of uh, Andrew Jackson. And the Eaton Affair is something that is kind of important for two reasons. The first is that it led to the breakup or it broke up Jackson's presidential cabinet. I think it was four cabinet members ended up resigning. Um, so politically, it did have kind of a, a significant consequence as far as the executive branch goes. But it's also an incident that demonstrates the influence of women, I'll say maybe on politics. Before suffrage, right? This is an era in which only uh, men can vote, and any talks about expanding the vote, you know, we call this chapter Jacksonian democracy, are really only concerned with the voting rights of men. Suffrage as a movement is still a couple of decades away, and the reality of suffrage, women's suffrage actually being the law of the land, is about a hundred years away. So, in an era before women had the right to vote or hold office. This affair kind of gives us a little bit of an insight in terms of how women could influence politics, mainly as the wives of political leaders. 
Um, and it happened during Jackson's presidency. So this uh, affair or, um, I don't know, scandal, you might want to call it, uh, revolves around Margaret Eaton, who is pictured here. Uh, this is a photo of her long after the incident took place, 1875. So that's her about, I don't know, 18, uh, about 40 years after the incident took place. We'll say her husband served in the Navy. And Margaret was accused of cheating on him. So while he was gone, she was accused of having an affair um, while married, and she was having an affair with kind of people who were in the inner circles of the political elite, right, in Washington, D.C., and so she became kind of the center for a lot of the gossip of the era. Uh, rumor has it that her husband, upon finding out that Margaret Eaton was cheating, that he actually killed himself. That turned out to be false. He did die, but he died of something else. But the rumor was that the news was just so strong to bear that he committed suicide. And so what that did was it kind of made... Eaton, a social outcast. Nobody really wanted to associate with her uh, for that reason. Now, the way that it ended up infiltrating into Andrew Jackson's cabinet is Margaret Eaton had married John Eaton, changed their name, who was the Secretary of War. Secretary of War John Eaton was part of Andrew Jackson's cabinet. Another member of Andrew Jackson's cabinet was John C. Calhoun, who we talked about earlier. His wife was Floride Calhoun. And the trouble started when Floride, the wife of um, John C. Calhoun, refused to go to like any social gatherings or be seen in public or speak with the wife of another member of the presidential cabinet. So you can imagine kind of Jackson meeting with his cabinet, all of their wives are there, they're trying to get along, and sort of this rift between Floride and Margaret Eaton ends up causing kind of all sorts of problems for, um, uh, you know, for the cabinet more broadly. So Floride Calhoun will say about her, refused to socialize with Margaret. And we'll say this caused issues within the cabinet. Um, there was also kind of another layer going on here. And that was, we have to remember that Andrew Jackson definitely kind of represented the sort of new or common kind of politics of the era. Jackson was new onto the stage. Same thing was true of John Eaton, the Secretary of War. So Jackson and Eaton kind of both represented kind of a new approach to politics, whereas John C. Calhoun, he represented more of the older style, the elite politician, right? He had been in D.C. before Jackson and some of his other people got there. So the effect that this had eventually, this, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, scandal maybe, uh, eventually led to the resignation of John Eaton. He resigned from Secretary of War over the affair. And we know that eventually, too, John C. Calhoun would also resign the vice presidency, and Andrew Jackson essentially would have to create a presidential cabinet that was brand new from the one that he had initially brought in. Section 7, the Bank War. Now, the Bank War probably defined Jackson's presidency more so than any other incident, um, at least in that time period. Um, since then, the legacy and presidency of Andrew Jackson is you know, debated, and, and you can make an argument that perhaps this was one of the lesser uh, kind of known or uh, 
lesser significant events of Jackson's presidency. But the bank war fundamentally symbolized this struggle between kind of elite and, and common. So we might say the bank war was the symbol of the elite slash common divide. So the bank war starts with the U.S. National Bank. At the time, it was the second bank or second bank in the United States. Please remember that Alexander Hamilton was responsible for creating the first. That bank expired under the uh, presidency of Thomas Jefferson, who didn't really like anything that Hamilton did. Um, so the second national bank was rechartered later. This was after uh, Hamilton's first bank. Started in 1816, and it did all of the things that a national bank, you know, really ought to do. It stabilized the economy. Kind of uh, kept the uh, smaller banks in, uh, in check. It controlled smaller banks. And we'll say paper money. So it was a financial institution designed to make the American economy run more smoothly. So it was chartered in 1816. It was given a 20-year charter. And really, politicians didn't really think too much about it. However, though, in 1819, a very bad economic panic hit the United States. Uh, the Panic of 1819, we'll call it a bad economic depression. Now, the reasons why the Panic of 1819 happened aren't really all that significant for us. But the most significant thing was that this panic, and this is true of when like panics and depressions occur more broadly, is that they tend to hurt those who have the least. So it's really kind of the working class and the poor that feel the brunt of the pain when it comes to these panics. And as a result of this, many people actually blamed the second Bank of the United States for the economic panic. We'll say many blamed the second bank for the panic. So Andrew Jackson, the champion of the common people, who here he's holding up a I don't know, I guess it's some sort of declaration, but you see a bunch of scared bankers running in terror from him. Um, Andrew Jackson made it his mission to destroy the bank, right? That was what the bank war was about. Andrew Jackson was going to destroy Second National Bank. He said, quote, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. And by taking on the National Bank, this was a way for Jackson to really kind of exercise presidential power in a way that was on behalf of the common people, right? It was a very kind of simple equation, uh, equation, excuse me. Jackson represented the common man and the bank, right? A bunch of these elite bankers represent elite corrupt society. And a lot of Americans, you know, this, this broader, I mean, it's not even just relegated to uh, American society, but this broader struggle of, you know, common and elite classes really became all wrapped up in this one single institution. And if Jackson could just kill the bank, that meant that like the little guy won. So the National Bank uh, was actually uh, try, uh, Congress had tried to renew the National Bank, uh, I believe multiple times. And each and every time Andrew Jackson responded with a veto. That is to say when the US Congress attempted to recharter, by recharter we mean sort of extend, because the first national bank was only given a 20 year life period. When the US, hmm, we'll add Congress here. When the US Congress attempted to recharter or extend the bank, Jackson vetoed it. And if you're not familiar, the veto is a presidential power um, 
that allows the president to strike down any law that comes from Congress. So as long as Jackson stayed the president, there was no chance that the uh, National Bank was going to be rechartered because he didn't have the power just to destroy it, right? He, he couldn't, it was set up for 20 years. He couldn't really do anything um, uh, that could end it immediately. But what he could do was to veto every, every chance to recharter it. And in fact, what he also did was he ran for president again. And as long as he won that election, which he did, it pretty much ensured that the National Bank would, would never continue. According to President Jackson, he says, the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their, to their selfish purposes. And so he saw this as a way of the rich sort of enriching themselves. Um, those that supported Jackson, not just in the bank war, but more broadly formed a new political party. The Democratic Party was created. New political party for supporters of Jackson. Jackson's opponents became very critical that Jackson was willing to use the veto more than any other president. In fact, Jackson's enemies called him King, uh, King Andrew, was the name for Jackson, because he used the veto. I think actually even more than all other presidents before him even put together was uh, was what he did. Uh, Name for Jackson because he used the veto. Um, we'll say that others used him of acting like a king. All right here is Congress. You know, Congress is essentially the voice of the people. The people vote for their members of Congress. And when Congress passes a law, pretty much the president should sign it in the law. Um, but here Jackson was, time and time again, vetoing legislation that, quote unquote, the people had, had elected. So he was acting like a, a tyrant, right? No other president had used the veto like this before. And, and Jackson was the first one to do it. And so the opponents of Andrew Jackson formed their own political party, and that is the Whig Party. And these were opponents of Jackson. So Andrew Jackson's presidency gives us a kind of new political system, um, or sorry, a new party system. So remember, the first party system in American history, the two political parties were uh, are Federalists and are Democratic Republicans, sometimes just only called Republicans for short. Now, the Federalists went out of business in 1812, and afterwards, the Democratic Republicans were the really only party in the country. It was one party rule. Uh, rule. It was, quote unquote, or here, we might do this easier. It was the era of good feelings. You know, and they called it the era of good feelings because there was no political infighting, right? There was only one political party. It seemed as if all Americans agreed on, again, seemed like it, uh, everything. But now with Jackson, we have a politician that brings us an entire new party system. And now we have the Democrats on one side, if you support Andrew Jackson, and the Whigs on the other. So Jackson's presidency, not only is he, well, first of all, we ought to mention that and if this wasn't uh, uh, clear, hopefully let's make it clear now. The second national bank was quote unquote killed. When Jackson won re election again in 1832, the charter to the national bank expired with Congress not being able to, um, uh, you know, to, to recharter it. So when the second national bank went out of business, when it was killed, that was a major kind of triumph of the kind of common American over corrupt elite institutions. Um, but what was also kind of in, in this is that 
you know, Jackson does have a pretty significant role in changing up the political party system. We go from the first party system to an era of good feelings. Jackson's presidency is responsible for the creation of two new political parties, which become the dominant political parties all the way up until the American Civil War. Section 8, Panic of 1837. So in this section, there's not really too much to explain, just a little bit about the consequences or impact of destroying the Second National Bank. And that is, in 1837, a, uh, we'll say another economic depression. And the textbook goes into a little bit more detail about all of the contributing factors to the Panic of 1837. Um, we can definitely think of, um, we can definitely think of the uh, destruction of the Second National Bank as being somewhat responsible for it. We'll just sort of make one point here about what helped contribute to this panic, and that is a law that was passed called the Specie Circular. Now, Specie refers to hard currency like gold or silver, and Specie Circular was a law that required Uh, land purchases, you know, land was, there's a lot of uh, speculation over land in this period, you know, um, railroads were kind of just getting underway. And so the idea was, well, how much is Western land going to be worth now that we can take a train there instead of riding a horse? And people thought it was going to be worth millions and it didn't turn out to be worth quite as much as people had had hoped for. But the Species Circular was a law that required land purchases to be in gold and silver. And they tried to kind of slow down the land craze. So they said, look, if we make people have to buy it in gold and silver, maybe that's going to make the price fall a little bit. The demand will, will lower. Um, the actual impact was that people just took gold and silver and bought it anyways, and banks were drained. Of their gold and silver reserves. Of gold and silver, which made them, say, weak, and the bottom line is to fail. So it left the banking system in a pretty, uh, a pretty difficult situation. And so when panic started to set in, soon was a, uh, an economic depression. Now, why is the Panic of 1837 important? Well, because it paves the way for the opposition political party. Now, Andrew Jackson was a very popular candidate. He was reelected. Uh, he was elected and then reelected. A brand new political party, the Democratic Party, was was created around him. But even Andrew Jackson, King Andrew himself, even he stepped down after eight years. Right? He followed George Washington's lead. He said, "I'm no longer going to be running for president." And so his vice president, Martin Van Buren, became the eighth president of the U.S. Martin Van Buren was, you know, he just wasn't not, you know, he wasn't as charismatic. He didn't have the same type of, like, persona that Andrew Jackson had for a tough guy. You know, Martin Van Buren was kind of a, a you know, like, he couldn't ride a horse, and he, he was much more intelligent than he was, you know, kind of a, a barbarian like, like Jackson was. So he didn't have the same kind of charisma, and he presided over the panic. So a lot of Americans came to blame Martin Van Buren for the Panic of 1837, and so that paved the way for the opposition party to take the White House, which is exactly what they did. And in the election of 1840, election, the Whigs took a, a page out of the book of Andrew Jackson and ran a war hero, William Henry Harrison. He was a general during the War of 1812. All right, so no longer kind of the, uh, you know, this was a way to try and appeal to a lot more voters. And as a general during the War of 1812, they say, look, this guy was a hero just like Andrew Jackson. Um, you know, you should, uh, you should vote for him. On top of that, in the election of 1840, they also wanted to portray him as a quote-unquote common man. So what they said about Harrison was that he was born in a lob cabin and that he drank hard cider. So we'll say about this, the log cabin and hard cider candidate. 
This was a way to convince the voting base that Harrison was a quote unquote common man. You know, that was kind of the secret. And in some ways, it's interesting because Jackson presidency also gives us kind of what we refer to as modern politics. You know, and a lot of modern politics, it does, you know, you do force politicians to have to relate to people, you know, no matter how educated or rich or wealthy they are, when it comes down to election time, political candidates will try desperately to make themselves seem like commoners. And so Harrison said, look, I grew up in a log cabin. I drink hard cider. I don't drink fancy wines. I'm just like you, you know, vote for me, even though Harrison was uh, from a rather wealthy uh, background. Um, the Whigs also took up campaign slogans. The famous slogan for Henry Harrison was Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Tippy Canoe was the battle that Harrison had won during the War of 1812, right? So they incorporated his kind of famous military background. Uh, Tyler was the VP. And um, what was significant about Tyler is that he was, let's see, what's, uh, what's kind of a way of uh, putting this? He was, uh, he was a Southerner, right? VP from the South. All right, so this was kind of like uniting the ticket together. Harrison was a Northerner in some sense, although, again, they both considered themselves to be opponents of, uh, of Jackson. And this gives us kind of a very um, interesting feature about this era in politics, and that is during the era of Jackson, we might just make this point here. Now, I don't know exactly where Harrison stood on this issue, but during the era of Jackson, Pro and anti slavery politicians could we'll say ally themselves over their mutual either hatred or love of Jackson. So you end up with some very kind of interesting political, um, political partners that would strike us today by very odd. Tippy, uh, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too is a little bit of that, right? Uh, William Henry Harrison and John Tyler weren't necessarily kind of from the same sections of the country and probably would disagree in a lot of things, but they both agreed that Andrew Jackson was a barbarian and because we both hate him equally, we'll, we'll kind of work together. Um, maybe a better example of this is the former president, John Quincy Adams. Remember in the election of 1824 and 1828, Jackson you know, technically beat him both times. John Quincy Adams goes on to become probably the probably the strongest abolitionist president before Abraham Lincoln, right? He goes on to defend enslaved people in the famous Amistad case after his presidency. So, you know, he is a high-ranking American political leader that is about as close to an abolitionist as one can get. John Quincy Adams and John C. Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, the former vice president, the leader of nullification, speaking of secession, um, John C. Calhoun, in many ways, is the most ardent defender of slavery in the antebellum period. Yet, both Quincy Adams and Calhoun belong to the same party. They work together in this period. Why? How could an anti-slavery and pro-slavery person work together? Well, at least for the time being, all because of this guy, right? Either you hate him or you love him. And that kind of, uh, you might say, distracts the country from the larger issue um, of time. So as a result of this log insider campaign, the Tippy Canoe and Tyler II, um, you know, campaign slogan, William Henry Harrison becomes the ninth president of the United States. But, fun fact, dies 
31 days after his election. So um, William Henry Harrison has the uh, unfortunate uh, kind of record for having been the president who served the shortest amount of time, having only died 31 days before, uh, or sorry, 31 days after he was elected. And so John Tyler became the 10th president of the United States. Now, as far as the Whig party goes, they were managed or they did manage to draw a lot of support from other kind of smaller political groups in the country. Your textbook outlines two of these kind of smaller political movements. One of them is the anti-Masons and the other ones are the nativists. The anti-Masons, this was a political party that opposed the secular, secular means without a religion, Freemason fraternity. Uh, the Freemasons were a secular fraternity that a lot of elite members of uh, American politics had belonged to. So, for example, um, people who had been members of the Freemasons included people like George Washington. Uh, ben Franklin was a member. I believe Henry Clay was a member. Yeah, Clay was a member of this organization. And dun -da -da -da, Andrew Jackson. And what the anti-Masons had suggested was that you know, kind of behind the scenes in this secret organization, the Freemasons were kind of behind all of America's political institutions, and they vowed they would never vote for a Freemason candidate. And so for that reason, they would never vote for Andrew Jackson, and they gave some of their, uh, um, um, gave some of their support to the Whig coalition. The second political movement that um, gave the Whig support in this era were the nativists, and these were the anti- immigrant party. And at this time, anti-immigrant was really, in a lot of sense, anti-Catholic. So as far as like Whig party positions go, a lot of, uh, not really a lot, but you know, the Whigs did try to appeal to kind of this anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic sentiment. And so many nativists also came to support, um, support the Whig party. Now, in terms of the broader issue of race, as far as Jacksonian democracy goes, there's a very kind of interesting development taking place. For a long time, this era was known as the rise of democracy, which in a certain maybe limited context was true. Now, what made Andrew Jackson's president possible was that when it came to voting, right, Traditionally, historically, in the United States, it required three things. It required um, one to be male or to be a man. Two, it required one to be a quote-unquote white person. And three, it required some ownership of property. Right? So immediately after the U.S. Const or I should say after the Declaration of Independence, every single state got to decide what the voting requirements were. And that, you know, in terms of the way that our government is set up, voting is typically done on a state level, states that get to get to decide. So not every single state is going to be identical, but for the most part, we could say that a majority of the states said, A, you have to be a man, B, you have to be quote unquote a white person, and three, you need to own property. By the time of Andrew Jackson, property requirements are being removed. in many states. And in fact, you know, your text, you know, kind of only gets to this point at the very end here, but it's important in understanding that this was how Jackson managed to get elected. And so we might just make a, a point here that, you know, without property requirements, you know, quote unquote, common people, could now vote for Jackson, right? That's how the barbarian got into office. Um, whereas before, had those property requirements remained in place, you know, who knows, 
right? You know, those who had property belonged more so to the elite classes and probably wouldn't have liked Jackson. But when property requirements were being axed, that allowed for a more kind of common representation. But at the same time that, that states were removing property requirements, they were actually creating more strict requirements than it came to race. Again, depending on sort of a state-by-state -state basis. Now, in the states of the South, African Americans or Black Americans would have been completely prohibited from voting. But in the North, um, it could depend, right, on a state-by-state -state basis. So, for example, in many cases, Black voters might still need property, right? So some state laws got rid of the property requirement, but only got rid of the property requirement for white voters. In other states, black voters were completely barred from voting altogether. And in fact, it was only in four states that African-Americans had identical voting criteria Uh, compared to whites. So yes, there is an expansion of democracy, but while expanding democracy for the white population, many states simultaneously further restricted voting rights for black Americans.